is 9 a.m. So let's get started. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for spending your time with us on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm the panel director, Chang He. I'm a PhD student in the anthropology department at Brown University. I'm also the moderator for this panel on civic activism and NGOs in China with three subtopics, technology for good, hashtag me too, and COVID-19. I know it's not easy to commute yourself to something at 9 a.m. on a Saturday, so it's really great to see you all. And thank you to our panelists for agreeing to sharing with us today. I will introduce each of them just in a moment. And I want to start by clarifying that NGO, non-governmental organization here is broadly defined because it's not an official legal category in China, although it's still used by many practitioners. The more overarching term that I think serves this panel better is gong yi, public or common good, which can include a broad range of activities, including social organizations, activism, social enterprise, and so on. So um, now for the best presentation of, of our materials today, I kindly ask you to keep yourself muted if you're not the panelist that's speaking. And when panelists are presenting their PowerPoints in viewing options on the top right, right next to the green screen share bar, which you will see later when um, someone's sharing their screen, choose the side-by-side -side mode. And I will remind yourself of that later again. This is a featured panel of the 2020 Brown China Summit. Um, and I, I wanna thank everyone on the team for making the effort to put this together during a pandemic. That's admirable. And moving on to introducing our panel topic today, civic engagement of diverse forms has a long tradition in China, ranging from grassroots voluntary organizing to national or even international scale NGOs. With the COVID-19, the enthusiasm and the need for such engagement are again on their rise with many new forms of organizing, as well as new challenges. We have four amazing guests from three civic groups today to talk to us about their journey working as NGO practitioners or activists. We will hear for about 20 minutes from each of the groups to introduce their work with us. After all panelists have presented, I will kickstart the conversation with some of my own questions. We will also open up the floor to give you a chance to ask questions to our panelists. Feel free to comment your questions in the chat box at any time, and we will collect them to be addressed later. At the end, you will also have the chance to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. So the first one to speak with us today is Professor Jing Wang. Professor Wang teaches Chinese media and cultural studies at MIT, where she's also the founder and director of the New Media Action Lab. Professor Wang developed NGO 2.0, an information communication technology powered activist project serving Chinese grassroots NGOs since 2009. NGO 2.0's main programs include civic hackathons and the recently launched Future Village project which she will introduce us to shortly. Our second guest, Ms. Liu Ping, is the founding editor-in-chief of Feminist Voices New Transition. It is among the most influential communication platforms on feminist activism in China. Liu Ping is a leading feminist activist from China. She has been working on women's rights issues for more than 20 years. After she relocated to the US in 2016, she co-founded a new organization in New York to support feminist movements in China, including the hashtag MeToo movement, which is her topic for today. Last but not least, we have Ms. He Jian and Ms. Lin Shutong, both from Fisher and Friends Charitable Association, FNF Gong Yi Xiaozu, to talk about how they have been fighting COVID-19 in the past almost three months. Mr. He is the head of procurement and the UK hospital liaison, joining us from the UK today. Ms. Lin is the head of logistics and communication, joining us from China. Their group, FNF, was established by a group of Chinese individuals studying and working in the UK in late January. Initially, it was set up to provide adequate medical supplies to hospitals in China. As the situation of coronavirus deteriorates in the UK, since the beginning of April, the group has shifted its focus to assist the UK National Health Service. Now, without further ado, let's hear from Professor Wang on NGO 2.0 and non-confrontational activism. Again, please make sure that you choose the side-by-side -side mode in viewing options. Um, Professor Wang, I'm gonna 
unmute you and you can start your screen share. Uh, thank you, uh, He Chang. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my first time of using Zoom to give a public talk. So if we experience glitches, please uh, bear with me. Um, I want to first thank He Chang for inviting me. Her invitation came timely because I just published my new book, The Other Digital China, Non-Confrontational Activism on the Social Web. Uh, this book grew out of my 10 year long experience of running an NGO in China. Um, today I'm going to follow this menu. I'm going to summarize the conceptual framework of non-confrontational activism, introduce NGO 2.0 and provide two examples of social media activism. And then I will talk about the new program we launched uh, last summer, Future Village. First, uh, what is this book about? Uh, the book is devoted to the ICT practices, um, hold on, I can't see it, emerging from China's social sector caught at a transformative moment, thanks partly to Web 2.0 technology and, uh, and uh, the company Digital Utopianism, and partly to the party's alleged commitment to policies aimed at energizing the weak social sector. Now with this book, I'm, I'm trying to answer this question. What does the ecosystem of social media activism look like in China today? Now uh, in the old uh, ecosystem, the major civic actors were the NGOs. But uh, since 2009, after social media had gone mainstream in China, uh, the, new, uh, the old ecosystem has changed because microblogging brought in on a massive scale, four new groups of civic actors, and they are the free agents, the corporate sector, the software developer communities and maker labs, the university sector. All those uh, social actors share a commitment to uh, making incremental change rather than throwing a street revolution. And I argue that together those actors from diverse sectors are building a coalition to uh, bring incremental change to Chinese society in spite of uh, censorship. So in other words, my book is about the gray zones, uh, the gray zones in China. That is the majority of Chinese activists practice non-contentious uh, social actions. Next, I want to say a few words about the key word uh, non-confrontational activism. Uh, Chinese social actors I named above uh, don't fit squarely into the profile of activists prescribed in the Western liberal tradition. The Chinese uh, change makers are walking around obstacles rather than walking through them, navigating tactfully between what is lawful and what is illegitimate. And we are all familiar with the Western liberal thinking that equates action with resistance and social change with the street revolution. I think uh, this is, it's about time that non-confrontational activism is conceptualized and fully documented with uh, case studies. Now, generally speaking, uh, activists practicing non-confrontationalism uh, are anonymous because their action purposefully attracts no attention. They stay on margins of history and they remain peripheral to academic discussions on social actions, even though it prevails in all autocratic regimes, where activists resort to other means of serving social good than openly critiquing and openly rebelling. Now, in my book, I um, incorporated a long discussion of the critical literature revolving around the concept of non-confrontationalism. Here, I want to introduce one book, uh, James C. Scott's Weapons of the Week. Uh, uh, everyday Forms of uh, Peasant Resistance. Scott introduced the concept of, uh, the concept of invisible agents and their quiet and piecemeal tactics. He also gave credit to what he called uh, calculated conformity. Uh, Scott's peasants typically avoid uh, dramatic and uh, direct confrontation with the authority. 
Instead of condemning those peasants' silence as complicitous or devoid of politics, Scott locates the sites of peasant action in micro inconspicuous forms of uh, actions, such as foot dragging, false compliance, feigned ignorance, and so on. Um, and uh, his work uh, presents a significant milestone in valorizing the powerless as political agents. Now, a similar line of research was also conducted by political scientists based in North America. When we come to a country like China or other illiberal uh, societies where open resistance is not the norm, but rather the exception, we uh, as researchers are called upon to conceptualize beyond the white and black dichotomous mode of thinking to solve a puzzle. The puzzle is, uh, why are the exploited in those countries accept their situation as a normal or even as a justifiable part of social order? Are Chinese people fatalistic, complicitous, or paralyzed by fear and cowardice? Well, that is the conventional reading of the muted consensus of Chinese people over maintaining the status quo. Uh, the need formulation, this need formulation relegates the entire population of China into the category of the brainwashed. In reality though, uh, Chinese people have more choices than being brainwashed or becoming martyrs. Uh, what's missing uh, in the scholarly research about China is the massive middle ground in which conformity is often a self-conscious strategy and that it might be possible for us to think of a continuum of situations ranging from the free dialogue between equals, which is what Habermas called ideal speech situation, all the way to the concentration camp. So what is uh, understudied in the China field is this continuum of situations, um, the middle ground or the gray zones in which Chinese activists navigate day in and day out. Uh, I want to say that I myself uh, practice non-confrontational activism through uh, NGO 2.0. Now let me talk about my organization. Uh, in 2009, during my year-long sabbatical in China, I set up NGO 2.0. And in 2014, uh, we were registered in Shenzhen. Uh, we celebrated our 10th anniversary last summer. And uh, during my 10-year-long experience of running NGO 2.0, I uh, I encountered a variety of puzzled re responses from my friends and my colleagues in the U.S. They wonder how could uh, a quote-unquote a foreign NGO specializing ICT uh, media and social media activism survive at all in such an adverse environment? Well, I think the question is a false question. First of all, NGO 2.0 is not an international NGO. From day one, I made sure that we set it up as a Chinese NGO operated by a largely indigenous Chinese team. So the challenges we're facing are no different from the challenges faced by all other grassroots NGOs in China. Uh, the question we should ask instead is, how have Chinese NGOs fared through the successive reigns of an authoritarian regime? Um, my response to that question is to fare well in China requires a different mindset and strategy, which is learning the, the art of restraint and following the centuries old cultural logic of finding the middle ground where missions, however difficult, will get accomplished. So for Chinese activists, this means producing social good without uh, taking to the streets, throwing a street revolution or confronting the state. Now, during my 10 year long experience of running NGO 2.0, I was exposed a bit by bit to a gradually unfolding, captivating picture of social media activism in which multiple players from diverse sectors are leveraging the network effect of Web 2.0 to create uh, incremental change in China. Uh, NGO 2.0 started with uh, social media training, uh, Web 2.0 training workshops. We train uh, grassroots NGOs in the western and central provinces of China, uh, teaching them how to learn 
social media to engage in participatory thinking to launch interactive advocacy campaigns to increase the transparency of their operation and design online crowdfunding projects and finally help them learn human-centered design to create solutions to social problems. To date, uh, we have trained approximately 2,000 NGOs. Uh, we also developed other programs. This is a uh, Web 2.0 toolbox for NGOs. And we also uh, developed a crowdsourced philanthropy map on which over 27,000 NGOs have registered their organization and project data. We also run civic hackathons, and this is the T of the ICT uh, in collaboration with uh, the IT sector and uh, software developer and maker communities. All of those uh, activities form part of my regular practice as a non-confrontational activist uh, in China. So next, let me introduce uh, two examples of uh, social media activism, which I nicknamed uh, Activism 2.0. Uh, first, a quick uh, definition of Activism 2.0. It refers to social actions triggered through peer-to-peer -peer networking between weak ties. And those social actions are mobilized via viral communications to create online support uh, communities at scale. Uh, let me give you two examples of Activism 2.0. My first example is the shaved head action. Uh, in 2011, Guangzhou-based uh, activist Peng Yanhui uh, wrote a web blog calling for uh, 1,000 fellow netizens to shave their heads as a symbolic gesture to stop the night illumination project on Pearl River, which uh, would uh, cost uh, the taxpayers 150 yu uh, million yuan without much justification. So um, Peng Yanhui posted the photos of himself before and after the shave on Weibo. And in 20 hours, he attracted uh, 4,000 retweets and recruited more than 20 people following him and shaving their heads, including a young woman and uh, several children. So you may wonder, what does uh, shaving one's head have anything to do with energy conservation? Well. <clears throat> Peng Yanhui argued mockingly that a thousand shaved heads could generate enough brightness to light up uh, the Pearl River and render the night illumination project unnecessary. We know that every joke is a tiny revolution because it upsets the established order. Uh, Peng Yanhui's uh, cheeky Weibo post went viral precisely because protests triggered by humor, which is uh, a potent form of non-confrontationalism could uh, camouflage the agitators while dumbfunding the censors. So under the pressure of uh, media exposure and public outcry, um, the Guangzhou city government eventually uh, trimmed down the original budget of night illumination by four fifths, so which is quite a victory. Uh, my second example was a campaign launched by a an LGBTQ NGO in China. When news broke that Iceland's Prime Minister Johanna and her lesbian lover are paying China an official visit, a grassroots NGO supported for gay love uh, strategized ways of using social media to promote social acceptance of uh, homosexuality. During and after the Prime Minister's visit, uh, predictably, her wife was erased from all state-sponsored uh, mainstream media. Uh, the former, uh, the NGO founder, his name is Atram, he spread the news through a blog uh, on Sina uh, po and posting it on Sina.com. And Sina featured his blog on the front page for a couple of days. The blog was an instantaneous attention grabber it had a, a click-through rate of more than 800,000 times within a few days. So it kicked off this uh, um, tongue-in-cheek campaign slogan, um, let's search for the prime minister's harmonized wife. Um, all those uh, successful uh, activism 2.0 campaigns rely on viral communications set off on Weibo, and they share one thing in common. The campaigners are well equipped with the skill of leveraging the hashtags uh, to engender hotspots to enhance engagement and build a virtual spectatorship. 
Um, <clears throat> so next, I want to switch gear and talk about the last item on my agenda, Future Village. Now, before I talk about this program, I need to first uh, get yourself acquainted with a uh, hackathon. And I will tell you why uh, later. Hackathon is known as a Hack Day Hackfest or Code Fest in which computer programmers and others uh, collaborate intensively on software projects. Those events typically run 24 hours or 48 hours. Now, when you throw NGOs into hackathons, it became civic hackathons. The mission is to connect makers with the uh, NGOs and through collaborative design, they will find solutions to social problems. Now, why, uh, why hackathon? Uh, because when we start uh, working on a Future Village uh, project, we first run a civic hackathon. Now, let's talk about uh, Future Village. We are all familiar with uh, the Smart City Paradigm, which is a top-down investment heavy and government-sponsored program uh, that gives a digital facelift to big cities. However, uh, NGO 2.0 is only interested in helping out uh, villages, not cities. And we are committed to energizing grassroots network and reviving grassroots culture. So we are naturally drawn to methods built on uh, grassroots mobilization. In a nutshell, if you want me to describe uh, Future Village, it's driven by a three-headed horse, tech for good, design for good, and poverty alleviation. Uh, through hackathons uh, as the first step, uh, we assemble makers and techie, software developers, researchers from material science, architecture, bioecology, design, public art, and more. Participants include the villagers, college students and teachers, high school students, programmers, designers, engineers, artists, etc. And jointly, we design a vision for Future Village. I'm going to share with you a Future Village project that is ongoing. Uh, we are collaborating with this NGO. They are located in, uh, in Inner Mongolia, Tongyu County, an environmental protection NGO. They are in the Kurtin Desert. They came to us with a communication need. They want us to uh, help them promote a new sand control method they invented to rebuild their grassland. Uh, this is their volunteer organization. This is a satellite picture of an experiment that they did. Uh, instead of planting trees in the desert, uh, they hemmed in a sandy area and built a fence around it to fend off uh, intruding animals and humans to let the land recover by itself. And the experiment, as you can tell from the satellite image, is very successful. So they came to NGO 2.0 with a communication need. They wanted us to help them to uh, make more people learn about their unique method of sand control and greening the desert. So we held a hackathon for, for, uh, for this organization and uh, we came up with four solutions. The first solution resorted to the concept of earth art. Uh, we're working with artists to design um, earth shapes that look cool, uh, well, especially from uh, from this uh, fr from the high up. Uh, interesting, um, interesting earth art is communication intensive by itself. Our second solution is a sound project, and we're working with music artists to design ways of collecting sound in the windy desert. Uh, and we will then sell the sound bites as ringtones to help the organization uh, raise funds. The third solution is a, is a fun uh, uh, mini game on WeChat. Now, um, let's uh, take a look at the, uh, the Fab Lab model underlying the Future Village paradigm. This is an MIT uh, innovation model. Fab Lab movement is closely aligned with the DIY movement, maker culture and open source hardware and open source movement in general. Um, if we compare the two different kinds of innovation models, uh, the traditional innovation model, uh, the, the agents are the scientists and the researchers and the venue is the lab and the goal is scientific development. Now in the innovation model Fab Lab, the agents include the clientele that is uh, in this case, the villagers. 
uh, the venue is the village. The village itself is the lab. Um, we promote social innovation and uh, social development. So the Future Village project demonstrates how an underserved community can be powered by technology at the grassroots level through collaborative design. These are our collaborators for the program. Um, they came from multiple sectors. Uh, in conclusion, I would say Future Village is a good example to illustrate the collaboration between multiple sectors to produce social good in a relatively invisible manner. Um, the sectors involved uh, include the free agents, uh, the IT sector, the corporate sector, the uh, university sector, and of course the NGO sector. I will call all those social actors non-confrontational change makers. And together, we are forming a decentralized multi-sectoral coalition, which is purposeful but non-contentious, driven by a powerful and spoken consensus of all the parties involved to build a better society. Uh, this is the end of my uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Wang, for such an informative presentation, combining both an academic perspective and also innovative practicing knowledge. Again, feel free to post questions in the chat box at any time. Now, please welcome Ms. Liu Ping to discuss the dynamics of hashtag MeToo in China in a transnational context. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I did. I, I will. I am perhaps. I. I will. Pro, um, perhaps what, what I will provide is a case. Is a more recent case. Um, I can uh, the dynamic. The dynamics of Me Too movement in China and in a transnational contact. Um, I can. It's hard to believe that uh, it was more than more than two years ago that uh, Me Too movement. Uh, Victims, some victims, some victims and activists launched uh, launched the first campaign of Me Too movement that was in the January of two thousand eighteen. Yeah, and yeah, and now, now that was 20, 28 years ago. <laughs> it uh, in my memory, it 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 was more like it is more like yes, yeah, happened 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 yesterday. Yeah, so and and. Mm, um, uh, the, the, this picture is the uh, this picture is one of the uh, memor uh, memorable moment memorable scene of Me Too moment. Uh, advertisement showed uh, show appeared on the street of Xi'an uh, and March of two thousand two thousand eighteen. Yes, so. Um, so this is two screen uh, two screenshots I found from my cell phone uh, to demonstrate the uh, how Me Too movement uh, unsettled our society with its uh, by its campaigns by the uh, fight of young people young people. So the the, the right uh, the left one is um, uh, left, the, the left one will, um, to the left one can show that. Um, from the beginning, from the beginning of January, uh, two thousand eighteen, the keywords of sexual harassment uh, jumped to its first uh, peak uh, on um, on WeChat and um, uh, the major social media, major uh, Chinese social media. And the second, the 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 right pe right picture shows that uh, since uh, since January nine, uh, 2018 to January to April uh, 2000, 2018 for the for the four months of that year, the availability of the keywords of um, sexual harassment on WeChat yeah struggled and jumped to and uh, hit its hit its uh, uh, higher higher point. Uh, so at the at the beginning at the beginning of the at the, so what happened at the beginning of that um, uh, January the January some um, some activists 
now, uh, a victim, a victim, for the first victim used, a, used her real name, revealed her keys to the internet, to the Chinese internet. And uh, several days after the, after uh, that sensational news uh, made by the victim, um, uh, uh, activists based in Guangzhou, Zhang Lele, launched a con organized a campaign and uh, uh, to ask for anti-sexual harassment uh, uh, mechanism on the national level and uh, campus level, and which uh, that and that campaign um, uh, organ uh, mobilized uh, mobilized near to ten thousand people in uh, within within about ten days. So that 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 that's what happened in that that um, in that January, and what happened in that April, uh, in the middle of that that month, some students uh, for in some most uh, prestigious uh, universities <coughs> protested in there to ask for to call for response to some uh, sexual harassment cases uh, happened in their universities. So this is a this is a picture to show to show that students in Renmin University blocked their one of their classrooms to uh, confront the uh, confront a uh, accused professor and at the middle of that uh, April. So uh, the the successful the the any success of this movement of the, this movement should be attributed to these brave young people. And uh, actually, the the major force, the major participant participants of this movement, a Me Too movement in China, uh, is definitely young people, young uh, and uh, young women. So why, 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 why? Can, how, how can how could my Me Too movement? Why, why and how Me Too movement could organize itself at that at that at that moment? Uh, Admittedly, it Me Too in China was triggered, was inspired by what happened in America um, in the uh, 2017. Um, but actually, the, I think the real cause, uh, real cause, is the anger, is the indig in indignation, indignation of young people who uh, may already made the de uh, determination that they don't want to India, India the gender-based violence anymore. And those and another important factor is that those young people have already had already identified themselves with feminism, even though that they cannot access to feminist edu feminist knowledge in the official education system, and some some of them uh, could not um, publicly themselves as feminist feminism but uh, but all the uh, uh, all i think uh, my thought is that all the moment uh, uh, has been developed under the um, uh, developed under the uh, feminist uh, context 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 even though people don't uh, even though some participants don't lay, um, uh, didn't labor themselves as feminist as feminist for a while for, for some, because of the uh, a, a stigma in this, uh, our Chinese society. So uh, I, 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 I will not give, I, I, I will not um, provide more details of, uh, more de uh, details about this moment. Uh, I'd rather I uh, make this form to show the evaluation eva what uh, uh, me too since to since 2018 to this year so in the first year for the in the first year of this moment more than 40 seasonal cases was reported and exposed to the internet and uh, um, some more well-known public figures and uh, professionals and uh, uh, journalists was accused of sexual harassment and sexual uh, assault. Uh, and the organizer and the who and the organizer of this year is victims, activists, and volunteers. But this in this year, I, I should say that in this year, all activists and uh, uh, organizations played. Um, 
more played more important roles than they were for than 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 than, than for last year uh, last next two years, and the the for uh, the, the 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 topic of this year me too of uh, this uh, focus on sexual harassment, and what um, and the victims self statements, uh, actual um, successful successfully organized um, organized. Um, um, more or organize volunteers who can share the feeling of the of them. So, but as I said before, that um, the some of the participants participants um, didn't didn't identify themselves as feminism at this year. Mm. So this and and so in this year's um, the 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 discussion. So the the participants participants successfully. Put put the uh, make uh, put the put the topic of gender equality and sexual harassment to the to the public agenda uh, the to the agenda of the public de public debate, but it's it's just the uh, it was just at the beginning. Um, so in the next when the time came to the next year to next year, few cases. Was it was revealed in the in two thousand nineteen? But um, the good news is that mo many some of the cases got a better solution, mm. and so and in this year uh, we can we witnessed um, some self organized network of victims and bloggers and uh, uh, volunteers. I mean, in this year, uh, participants know knew better about how to organize themselves. Um, and the topic, the focus, focus, focus of this year, um, expand from sexual harassment to broader gender issues. Mm. Um, and this is, and we can we it need, we can see we could see more diverse online creation, pictures, songs, anything. So many kind of multimedia creations to. Uh, inspired, inspired the moment, and they all uh, are created by the by the ordinary participants. Um, in this, um, in the two thousand eighteen, at the in March of two thousand eighteen, for the first time, uh, uh, overseas Chinese scholars and students um, make a make a make a petition to call for make a petition to call for. Um, gender equality. They 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 created a petition to. Uh, to they they wrote an open letter to um, education ministry for uh, anti-sexual uh, to support the claim of the clear claim of domestic uh, of of activists and active uh, volunteers based in New York City to show their support of the kids uh, the kids of Jingyao Jingyao is a victim and. Uh, um, uh, uh, a billionaire. I think all of you know know, know that that case. So, and in this year, another another change is that more people uh, publicly identify themselves as feminism, including some victims. I think this is a good news. Um, um, and well, around the and uh, Jingyao's case uh, was. Uh, uh, was reported on um, April of this year, and it uh, definitely it definitely um, evoked it very very a huge public debate or rape culture. So, um, when time comes to came to this year, uh, I'm very proud of our the victim. Uh, I'm I'm very proud of the this moment because that during the pandemic, during the epidemic, during the during the shutdown, uh, volunteers, fem young feminists, never stopped never stopped their concern about gender equality and gender based violence, and they already expand the issue issue issues they focus on to from just a sexual harassment to um, gender-based violence, discrimination, and other border and gender issues. And in this year, we can, they know 
very well about how to organ organize themsel themselves. Just at this moment, perhaps it, just at this week, uh, I know at least three teams of three teams organized by Chinese international students uh, are following three cases: Jingao's case and um, uh, an online sexual um, exploitation issue, and uh, the case of um, what's it? Bao Bao Yuming's case. Yeah, I mean there are three three uh, just as I know um, there are three three teams three teams <laughs> to follow on three cases and they all well uh, organized yes so I just give I just give one case to show to demonstrate how people how volunteers and activists organize themselves to uh, interview the uh, sexual harassment so this is uh, in um, September of last year, some of my friends, two of my friends, and two, uh, yeah, actually they are activists based in uh, uh, based in uh, United States. They decided to fly to um, Minnesota to witness the hearing of Jingao's case, and yeah. And there, and uh, when they after they arrived at that city, they met uh, two volunteers, local uh, volunteers there. So they had a small team up to uh, four people. So they witnessed the um, hearing uh, at, the, at the city, and a hearing at the court of that city, and they broadcast, they shot a video to and put and uh, posted that video to. Uh, Weibo. In a very single, uh, but in a very, uh, within a very single day, that short video got uh, more than two million hits, mm. and uh, their the, their information, like their information, their sharing, their report, their sharing of the that hearing uh, was mm, transferred by many mainstreaming media. Because they are, they were the only Chinese people there to witness all the process of that uh, of that uh, hearing. So I think the experience, uh, uh, I think the experience of this um, this this action is that first of all, you you cannot do anything by yourself. You need a team, even <laughs> so. At least you need at least one friend who would like to uh, pay for the ticket and buy herself and fly together with you. That's very important. So a feminist cannot work alone. Mm. Um, so first of all, you should, you, sh you, should have a you should have a team, you should have a, a line, a network. Second, you should set up an action. Um, yeah, that's a work, that's, a, that's all, that's actually, that's the primary work of organizers. And you create, and, and then create a scene for yourself. What does this mean? Uh, the, the, act, the organizer of this action said, to exp uh, said that, uh, to explain why he, why she decided to go to uh, Minnesota. Uh, he said, she said, I want to take, I, I would like to take a picture so that when uh, media mm, report on this case, I need not to see the ugly face of Richard Liu again. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I, 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 I would like to rep uh, use our picture to replace his picture. This is very, this is, this, this is very important. I mean that you can, if you want to, uh, if, if, if you want to, let people know you are uh, you, uh, you are there. Uh, let people know. Let people to hear you, to see you. You must uh, um, fly to the sense. You must create a scene for yourself. Yeah. So and that, so another another this, this, another experience is to utilize social media. Actually, the the problem, the major problem of social media, Chinese social media, is the censorship. But that that's, but that that doesn't mean there is no uh, space. Uh, that doesn't mean all space has been closed. I think you can all you can always find find space on social media. 
and um, and it's social media actually social media is perhaps is much more important than before because mass media are reluctant to report on feminist movement nowadays mm. another another thing is that another thing is that um, try to deliver alternative but a very strong message mm. so that you can the way you can compete it with the message uh, created by Richard Liu and some other rapists and other <laughs> and uh, his fellow rapists. Yeah. So this is this is a case. Uh, this is a case where, of how people organize themselves and uh, uh, create their, own, their message for this moment. Mm. Um, so this I I um um. I, I have talked about. I already talked. About, I have already talked about the censorship, um, and so the censorship can mostly the, is the most uh, is a prime reason that why the censorship of mass media is a prime reason that why people why the movement centered at social on social media and why um, it is limited. Most it is limit, limited to online activism, um, but uh, Pr uh, but about the one of the advantage of the advantages of online activism and so, on social media is that uh, you can organize people in a very in a very quick very fast speed very quick very speedily so uh, so so um, um the um the um uh, um, uh, um, uh, important feature, uh, characteristic of the uh, Me Too movement in China is that it is very poor. It lacks resources like legal, like victims. It's very hard for victims to get uh, legal aid. Uh, legal aid. Uh, it's just this is just an example, and there uh, there. There are few um, non-profit organization can uh, who, which could help could provide help for this moment uh, due to the um, uh, suppression uh, against uh, these organizations, and so the, this moment relies on volunteer labor of me of. Uh, of volunteers and uh, emotional labor of them, um, uh, among them. So people, volunteers provide lots of help to each other and to victims. I think without this kind of voluntary emotional labor, uh, we cannot see, we cannot see this movement can, uh, can sustain like the, to, to now. Uh, so this is also, I think this <laughs> women's women's emotion now is so important for the world. Mm. Mm. Um, um, uh, I, I use this picture to show that uh, this moment, actually this moment is, is kind of radical and confront, comfort, <laughs> confrontational. So, yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, I, uh, at one side, on the on one side, I can say I I can say that the feminist movement and the Me Too movement is not so confrontational, because it doesn't aim to overturn the regime, but it has been increasingly radical than before. I think mostly because because angry young people uh, realize that it is so hard to it is so hard to change the public policy and the system and but so and so they make themselves they so, so radicalize themselves to um, as a way to empower themselves i totally understand this process mm. um yeah and they never and okay so uh, that's, that's, that's the last part is the future. I use this picture. This picture. This this is a picture of uh, uh, the young girl. This picture is one of the volunteers who who 
is based in who are based in who is based in New York City. She organized the event to uh, in memory to mom Dr. Li Wenliang. Mm. So he, uh, he uh, she uses the whistle as the symptom as the as a sign of freedom freedom of speech. Um, this is yeah. This is this, this event was not a feminist event, but the organizers of this event and many participants attend of this event were feminists, young feminists uh, from greater New York, New York, a greater area, of New, greater New York City area. Mm, so uh, I use so I so I use this as an example to talk about uh, the role of the organizers. Um, as I said before, that the organizer, organizers, uh, networking people, networking people to make people get to know each other and uh, gather. But, yeah, um, the regime always try to isolate us. So <laughs> our task <laughs> to, is to gather people, and yeah, we should pro if the given that the moment is very poor, it's a lack of resource, lack of res lack resources. So we should provide resources available, we'll provide resources, provide the resources. Perhaps we have no money, but knowledge, the planning and the networking are also kind of resources we can, we can create and provide and share with our community. Another thing is that uh, ordinary participants always need a plan, and uh, our task is to give, to provide, and set up a plan, and so that people can come and uh, can join in. Mm. Okay, this is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss Liping, for sharing on such important and urgent topic. Finally, let's welcome Mr. He Jian and Ms. Lin Shutong to talk about kindness starts from something small. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize that we did not prepare for PPT. Uh, this is possibly because our work is still ongoing and we simply did not have the time. Um, my name is He Jian, and together with my colleague Lin Shutong, we are representing Fish and Friends. Please do not mistake, uh, mistaken his name for a charity protecting the marine life or the ecosystem of the ocean. Um, actually, we are a charity set up in late January this year to provide medical supplies to uh, hospitals and many other organizations in need. We come up with this name because our um, founder, Ms. Li Xuefei, her nickname is Fish. Unfortunately, she is otherwise engaged today. So Xu Tong and I are here today to share our journey of contributing towards the fight against COVID-19. So back in January 2020, we were seeing an epidemic on the rise. The number of confirmed COVID-19 patients has increased sharply from less than 100 to thousands by the end of January. The city of Wuhan was locked down overnight to prevent the spread of the virus. And also the outbreak hit us at a very bad time. Many factories and business were on holiday of the Chinese New Year and the production line was shut. So all these has created a temporary logistic problem and the short supply of medical PPE, namely uh, namely in the form of coveralls, masks and gloves, etc, etc. Um, we've learned that from the news, doctors and nurses had to wear wrinkles in the absence of proper protection. So imagine yourself in this scenario, what would you do? Many of us were deeply saddened by the news and were willing to help, but didn't know how. Miss Li Xuefei was moved by the news too, and she acted very quickly. Using internet, she found out the brand of the coveralls being sent to Wuhan and found online retailers in the UK selling the same brand of coveralls. She then posted a link to her circle of friends on WeChat, a social media chat platform, 
telling people to buy and post them to her address. At this time, she didn't even have a finalized idea of how exactly would she send this item back. But when you are dealing with a virus outbreak, time does not wait. And we think when there's a will, there's always a way. She was soon overwhelmed by the number of responses that she received in the matter of days. People shared her appeals for help to different chat groups. And many people, like Chinese students, Chinese working in the UK, bought the cover walls and sent them to Li Xuefei. Her flat was soon filled up. Also, a group of volunteers, like Xu Tun and I, joined in to help, bringing in different skills and expertise with us. We soon clarified our roles and responsibilities as our donation process matures. We started the project by providing people with links of retailers and asking people to buy products independently and sending them to a central location. Most of us haven't met in real life, so it's better not to deal with money directly, we thought. We realized that this wasn't the most efficient way. As our first shipment was sent to Wuhan successfully, we gained some credibility and trust and we then launched a fundraising campaign online. This has enabled us to centralize all resources and buying things in bulk, and also cut down on the time and money spent on postage. So Xu Tong owns her own business and has connections with various trading companies and business associations. She was put in charge of logistics and fundraising. We'll come to that point later. I am a chemical engineer by trade and had some experiences of dealing with chemical resistant cover walls and referencing to different uh, industrial standards and using them at my work. But I'm um, not to say I'm myself an uh, expert in the cover all standards. Um, but I think that the little skills that I had was very helpful and I, was been, I, have, I have been put in charge of the uh, standard checks and also liaising with um, other volunteers. So there are many people uh, joined the groups. Uh, we, at one stage, we had nearly uh, 700 people uh, from different parts of the UK and China um, you know, offering help to us. And we had a organization, uh, organizer panel of 10 people, people in charge of bookkeeping, people in charge of liaising with volunteers and managing various tasks of the process. I will now pass this presentation to Xu Tong and she will share her story from the logistic part. Hello everyone, I'm Xu Tong and uh, we soon realized we soon realize the most difficult part of this process is the logistics. We had no experience importing goods into China, especially when it comes to medical supplies, nor filling in customs forms. Above that, only about 5% of the whole logistics system works during New Year break. Our first shipment to Hubei Travelers brought back the cartons as whole luggages with their flights. At one stage, we had 20 tourist groups who offered to help to bring goods back. They were joking that they are like drug moves. Many organizations offered advices and assistance, such as airlines, business groups, as well as government sectors. For instance, China Eastern Airline and Chinese the Chinese embassy in the UK even gave us green lights to provide free transportation. After parcels arrive China, they are, rare, they are like rare jewels. We are very afraid every day that they might get lost uh, or stolen on the way. At the beginning of the Chinese New Year, most of the delivery guys are part-time workers. With much concern, we made several calls to people at pickup services to ask them to disguise our luggage. We asked them to use black plastic to wrap our goods cartons and claim them as adult diapers. During the hand-to-hand -hand transportation in China, 
we try to keep the whole process as low key as possible to keep them keep these medical goods safe. The last few miles were the hardest because many cities were in lockdown and the normal distribution channel was interrupted. But luckily, there, uh, there are many self-organized groups like us, but at total different heroic, heroic level, running things at frontline. Drivers volunteer to help and deliver at donated PPE to hospitals. These people are not recognized by government author uh, authorities, or, and, but they are doing this risky job out of empathy and love. For months, many of them do not have warm food and they have to stay at traffic checkpoints or sleep in the van or their cars. They were exposing themselves to high risk of infection. The next is our dilemma, who to help first? After we contact local volunteers drivers to help us distribute our PPE to hospitals, word spread it very quickly. As our donation gets more exposure, we get calls from hospitals, police stations, warehouses, morgues, and other institutions ask for PPE. The reality is that we did not plan PPE for these organizations. We realized that the way we planned were not uh, very thoughtful because we neglected many groups of people who actually needed proper protection. It is not easy to decide who to distribute our medical needs in a fair way. Not only hospitals, there are so many other institutions are also in severe shortage of personal protective equipment. Nurses and workers in pharmacy is the major group that they are neglected a lot. Their job is quite dangerous because they have con contact with patients and patients' relatives every day. Also policemen on the roads, workers who are transporting dead bodies. The, uh, then we had a meeting to replan the distribution. We have expanded our purchase to include industrial coveralls, the types that cannot, use, cannot be used in ICT in close contact with patients. We give all the industrial coveralls to those minority groups above who are not, um, who are not in hospitals but also in the front line. Now, um, her, my colleague her will continue with this topic. Uh, thank you, Shu Tong. Back to me. Um, as I mentioned, I have been put in charge of the standards and, um, you know, because I had some experiences dealing with uh, different industrial standards and, um, you know, I used the medical, uh, not medical, sorry, chemical resistance covers before. Um, but I feel one thing I want to emphasize is during this entire process, we were never fighting a, a, a war by ourselves. There are many other organizations and groups and individuals who are doing exactly the same thing as us. They all chipped in to help and they shared all the information, their expertise, their skills. And they, you know, when I was doing the standards, there were a group of um, people in Wuhan and they, they basically published a journal of the government policy with regards uh, to the standards requirements of different couples. So every day they would go to the government website and find out what, is, what are the latest developments and see if there are new products being included uh, in the acceptable items, uh, list of items for the medical use. Um, so, uh, you know, we had people in charge of purchasing and buying. We had people in charge of um, uh, bookkeeping and many other people chip in to help us group. And so at end of the uh, February, uh, at end of February, we managed to uh, fundraise nearly 75,000 US dollars of um, US dollars of goods and uh, sending all these items back to 33 hospitals and other organizations across 10 provinces in China. 
So it, it is something I'm quite pleased with and all my uh, members are very happy. Um, but I, I, I think this is not a individual effort. It was the combined, the collectiveness of the collectiveness of kindness and generosity of different people made this project possible. So as the situation stabilized in China, um, we, we, we are seeing the number of patients in hospital decreasing. And also, um, the, when we were talking to the hospitals, we realized that they had um, you know, sufficient supplies to carry on for a few weeks. Um, we have shifted our focus to help the Chinese community in the UK. Uh, many of them are Chinese students and some of them um, Chinese people living in the UK. Um, partly because the British government had a different approach um, in terms of attacking the coronavirus. Um, the UK government did not uh, carry out as many tests as uh, South Korea or Germany did. And also they were asking people with mild symptoms to isolate, self-isolate at home. And so the Chinese community here in the UK, um, some of them are a little bit worried about the approach that the British government is taking and they feel I, I can understand them because they feel they are living in a country in a foreign country and in in the crisis of a pandemic they probably want to get reunited with their fam with their family and friends back in China so the students who helped us before many of them uh, donated products to us or many of them um, you know even spent 20 minutes of their sp uh, spare time between lecturers to carry out a few talks before us um, are now were then you know flying back to China so we gave the remaining of the uh, coveralls and masks um, to these Chinese students and Chinese community members um, to prepare for the journey going back to China because we want to make sure they are safe and there is no cross-contamination on the flight and do not bring any trouble to the already, um, you know, uh, already busy nation dealing with the coronavirus. So that's, we then gave out roughly uh, a few hundred of masks and uh, about 200 uh, industrial coveralls to the Chinese community. Um, moving the time forward to the 1st of April, uh, the situation in the UK has deteriorated very much. Um, you know, we are seeing the same thing happened to China all over again in the UK, and the number has increased very sharply um, to a few thousand cases in the UK. And NHS, the national health system of the British government, uh, national health system, uh, initially they were not accepting donations from the public, but at that time they started, you know, they cave in and they started to accept the donations. So we then withdraw on the strength and experiences we had, uh, you know, donating and helping China. Uh, we withdraw that strength and set up another fundraising campaign um, helping the NHS, the National Health System, because we feel that uh, we live here and we studied here. Uh, we, we have the right to protect the places uh, where we are living now, just like we did for our motherland to China. So um, uh, by, by today, we have roughly um, 10,000 US dollars in our crowdfunding uh, campaign. And we have already uh, sent out our medical supplies that were bought from China to various hospitals in London and across the UK. Um, so the takeaway point from this whole journey is we feel that through this entire process, our group has been carried forward by the collective willingness and kindness of the many. Um, I want to say this was not a individual uh, project of 10 people or, you know, of the 700 people who helped us at various stage, but rather people like you and me, they all see this, you know, a uh, huge pandemic on the rise and they realize that the, the nation and many other nations like the UK, our, you know, our motherland was in need and they all offered to help. And we were only a small group among many other groups. And the combined force together 
um, I think, uh, supported the government effort of uh, contacting, of attacking the virus. You know, um, sometimes the government, um, uh, they, they are dealing things at a very large scale, but, um, you know, being a government body, sometimes they can be uh, delays or um, postponed in the responses. And that's when small organizations like us can chip in to help. Um, we are not competing with the governments from the very beginning. We're very clear that our role is to uh, contribute towards the overall efforts. So uh, I, I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, say thank you to all the volunteers and uh, our donors who helped us along the way and without whom this project would not be possible. And at the moment, uh, we, we know that we are only seeing maybe uh, the beginning of this global pandemic and uh, there's a long way to go and we we are con you know continuing uh, our efforts of um, helping the people in need mainly the, the frontline workers the nhs workers and we hope that with the effort of british people the effort of chinese people we can build a bridge between the two country and really help the, the british government to um, uh, provide the, the NHS workers with the adequate equipment to keep them safe and to let them to protect our lives. And uh, I just want to say, please, you know, if you are in a, in a country, in a place uh, uh, being infected by the coronavirus, please, please stay indoors. And uh, by doing so, you will be saving lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. He Jian and Ms. Lin Shutong. I'm sure your work is greatly appreciated and inspiring to many. Thank you all to our panelists for sharing with us. Now we will move on to our Q&A section. We have about 20 minutes. We welcome both questions and comments, but we'd like to hear the questions and the panelists' responses first. If you don't have questions but have a comment to make or a story to share, if we have time, we can do that at the end. Please keep your questions and comments concise and clear. If you speak directly through the audio or video, I may interrupt you if you go over one minute. As I said, you can type your question in the chat box, then I will read your questions. Or you can raise your hand, your virtual hand on Zoom. If you don't know where it is, it's at the bottom of the screen. If you click participants, there will be a hand raise function. And you can raise that, that hand and I will unmute you. Um, to talk to you with our panelists. And to our panelists, if a question is not directed at you, but you have something to contribute, please feel free to jump in and talk to each other. Now, I have one question or two actually to, for all of you to get us started. Um, the question is, can you share with us one most difficult moment and one most rewarding moment from doing your work? Um, Professor Wang, can you get us started with this question? Do you need more time? Oh, I can't. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, when we started uh, NGO 2.0, uh, that was the year of 2009. And then in 2010, I believe we did a workshop in Yunnan and then uh, 2011 in Hefei, uh, Anhui province. At that time, uh, Web 2.0 was uh, totally unfamiliar, not, not only to the NGOs, but also to the government. So I, I remember that we were really chased around by the public uh, security officers in Yunnan, uh, in Kunming, and in Hefei. Um, at one time, we were forced to, um, uh, to move our training venue from a university campus to an internet cafe because we were not allowed to, to do the workshop on university campuses. So, so that happened uh, in those two years, uh, I got really frustrated. So I made a strategic decision. I decided to hold a workshop in Beijing because I thought, well, if the central government didn't like what we did, then I will just call it off. Uh, so we did that workshop in Beijing and it was smooth sailing. There was no intervention from authorities. So from then on, it was smooth sailing. That was one difficult moment. The other difficult moment uh, came in 20, 
18, when the government clamped down on foreign foundations, because our funding pr primarily came from Ford Foundation in Beijing. So they were in the limbo and we had to wait for the whole year without any funding. And that was very difficult. But then, you know, they, they got a, I think they got a, their license renewed in China later on. All right, so that's my experience. Oh, most rewarding experience. Uh, one of our first uh, students, um, NGO students in 2009, he is the founder of uh, an environmental NGO in Gansu uh, province, uh, Rescue Mingqing, Zhengjiu Mingqing. Uh, he learned how to do social media to raise funds and to do send control. And uh, I think two years ago, he donated 5,000 yuan to NGO 2.0. And that we were really, really uh, touched. Uh, it, it, well, it, it just shows us that uh, our teaching has done some good uh, to the NGO. Okay, that's my experiences. Great, thank you. Um, and then Ms. Lupin, would you like to answer the question? Most, one most rewarding moment and one most difficult moment. I had many most difficult moment of, of my life for my life. <laughs> the recent one is, is def, was definitely <laughs> the the month after the day and the month after the after feminist voices uh, was censored from the internet. Yeah, well, not because it posted any articles, but it, because it was regarded as a my, uh, behind the stage manipulator of Me Too moment. Yeah, I agree that that's not true. I, I, I won't deny uh, that we provide, we, we, we contribute as much as we contributed as much as we could to the moment, but we're definitely not the <laughs> manipulator of the young people, of those, those so smart and brave young people. So, uh, uh, the feeling at that time was like that I lost uh, half my, half my life, half my, my half myself. <laughs> yeah, and it's the, the it's so it's so cruel it's so cruel to experience that kind of feeling. Yeah, so um, and it's it, so the, the, the so the first uh, the first um, question is that how can how can I how can the question is that how can an activist how can an activist survive from this kind of failure and loss? Yeah, but actually I think that the survival of a fair activist always means that the uh, the continuity how uh, the, the always means that she how she could continue his activist her activism. Yeah, so two two. Two years later, I have already, I see that so many, so many other, uh, I, we, we have created a new community here in America, I mean, in, in North America, and some um, young activists, young volunteers, I already, I already know two or three years ago, finally make that decision to organize their own activism. That means this, uh, this means uh, they, their activism uh, means a lot to me. Yes, I think, yeah. Is there one most rewarding moment from your work that you would like to share? Uh, most. <laughs> there, are, there are also many most to this kind of moments. Yeah, at the beginning of, oh, okay, I'll go back to go back going back to the, the start point of me too moment uh, at the beginning of, at the beginning of that january uh, we decided to organize a campaign to call for anti-sexual harassment mechanism on the national level and uh, generally the uh, organizer of that campaign set up the aim of that campaign that he said she said that uh, she hoped there would be there would there would be 10000 people support that that Campaign. At that time, I thought, oh, it's perhaps it's not impossible. How can we gather so many people? But actually, we achieved that goal within ten days, and people said that it was perhaps was a, 
most uh, huge, the hugest moment of Chinese students <laughs> for so many years, for many, last many years. Yeah, I'm very proud of that, that, that moment. Mm. Great, thank you for sharing with us. Now, uh, Mr. He Jian and Ms. Lin Futong, would you like to answer this question? Do you want to go first? Um, sure, okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, yes, the most difficult um, moment. Uh, we feel that through this entire process, because our small organization uh, is not recognized by the government, the Chinese government or the British government, um, so we have to do a lot of firefighting tasks um, out of the blue. So each day we, we come across different things, um, you know, trouble with the logistics, trouble with the storage, or the uh, many other things. So there are many, many, um, you know, difficult moments and, uh, that I want to mention, but um, the, the one um, really, um, you know, strike me is um, we had about 20 cartons of, um, of medical supplies sending back to China, each of them weighing um, 26 kilograms. And uh, we feel that we, we've done our research and prepared enough paperwork for the customs um, so we can declare uh, these products for donation and uh, going through the uh, custom green channel. Um, but once the, the 20 boxes reached uh, Shanghai airport, they were uh, hold, not seized, but um, you know, put on hold by the Chinese government because um, we we didn't prepare enough document. Okay, so um, we were giving 24 days, uh, sorry, 24 hours to uh, basically uh, supply the custom with uh, invoices, the the country of origin of the products where we bought them, and the exact uh, quantity of uh, individual items. So um, we had to. Um, deal with that, you know, and uh, time pressure. And also the, the, there's a time difference between the UK and China. So we had to, um, you know, deal with that within 24 hours. And the, the Chi I have to say the Chinese customs were, were very helpful and they, they did not give us a difficult time, but rather just released the, 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 the goods when they see the, the, the required documents. And so the most rewarding part would be you know, uh, once the government released the, 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 the parcel and once the, the, the coveralls, the mask and the gloves were uh, put on the uh, hands of doctors and nurses and many other volunteers, we feel that we've done something good to protect their safety and health. And we hope that um, they can use our supplies and they, they will feel in their hearts, um, you know, a warm, uh, some some a little bit warmth from abroad. So that's that's my part. Hi, I'm Shuto. So the most difficult part for me is the uh, during the lockdown of Hubei province and all the transportation was shut down, all the roads were locked down. So there was our for when there was our first shipment to Wuhan, there were 12 cartons. We sent those cartons by Shunfeng to Jiangxi province first because the parcels cannot go directly into the uh, cities in Hubei. Uh, but when we were sending one driver to pick up our um, 12 cartons from Jiangxi province, uh, the checkpoints, the police didn't, does not let the driver go out of the Hubei province. So I was very stressed out then because I was by myself and all my colleagues were in UK. Uh, but after that, we asked the checkpoint people to help us just literally move the, um, the cartons from the car in in Jiangxi province and upload load them onto the cars in uh, of our driver's car in Hubei province. Uh, then that thing was sorted out. There are a lot of uh, unexpected, difficult moments, but I was, our team I will really appreciate that we always got many lucky moments because 
there are always kind people to come to help. And for me, the most rewarding moments is just when the when the cartons arrive at the hospitals, and when we hear um, either policemen or doctors say, "Oh, we receive your your um, your cartons and your the PPEs," and we feel very pleased. It's just very simple. Thank you. Okay, thank you for answering the question. Um, and I have another question for Professor Wang. Um, why did you choose to work as both a scholar and a practitioner? And what does having two roles look like for you? Okay. Uh, you want me to talk about uh, my experience or why am I doing this? Uh, why am I um, get involved in activism, even though I'm a professor. <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. So my discipline is cultural studies. And for those of you who are not familiar with the discipline, it's a discipline that examines how power is produced and reproduced in social structures and social organizations, and where challenges to the power structure are located and uh, disseminated. And we, you know, as culture studies critics, we constantly talk about power relationship between the center and the peripheral. Uh, and uh, we speak for the marginalized and the disenfranchised. So I'm just practicing what I preached. Uh, as you know, in American academia, uh, we are a self-sufficient industry in itself. We usually just publish uh, articles or books that people don't understand. So this is my way of um, like practicing what I'm teaching, what I'm preaching and make it accessible. And I also am really tired of communicating with uh, many, uh, many of my not, my, not my peers, but academics who are so used to um, perceiving China in the context of Western liberalism, and they don't think that they are activists in China. So this is my way of talking back to those people who do not believe that uh, that uh, activists in China are doing good work. Thank you for the answer. Now we have several questions from the audience for Ms. Lu Ping. Um, I will just read them briefly and Ms. Vipin, you can combine your answers or answer them one by one. So the first one is, um, could you talk more about emotional labor and the distinction between emotional labor and affective labor? And um, after seeing so many cases reflecting sexual inequality, is there anything in particular you want to share to address to all women regardless of their um, education class uh, and age backgrounds? And finally, do you consider any cases from homosexual issues, especially for gays in China, that might face the similar situation as women faced? Uh, Ms. Lu Ping, would you like to answer these questions now? I, I, I start from the last question. Yeah, uh, LGBT uh, community definitely country have have been contrib have been contrib have contributed a lot to fem to Me Too movement. Um, yeah, but I'm not the perfect uh, people to speak for, speak to speak for, speak for them. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert for uh, LG, gay rights. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 uh, but I, I definitely uh, confirm that they, uh, they, they, they contribute a lot to the, to the moment. Mm. Um, for the second question, um, I, I I heard I read a I read a sentence from a book of a, a Hong Kong professor, uh, which is that that mm, there's no people there's no people there's no people oh how to say uh, no people is one hundred percent subservient. People are always looking for chance to re resist. This is my belief as an activist. So uh, the the task um, 
the task of the mission of activist of organizer is to is to fulfill fulfill the needs of resist of the people. No. But that doesn't mean that we. But that that doesn't mean that we can dominate anything. I mean, we what we do, what we what we what we do is just to, to provide alternative options of activism and knowledge for people. Uh, as long as they meet us, as long as they decide, they make their decision to work together with us. We can work. We can work together. But before that. I'm anyway. Before that, after that, I'm I'm always here. I'm always available for potential uh, potential uh, volunteers of the moment. Yeah, this is um, uh, another. Um, and um, yeah, uh, please don't mind uh, the exact word I use. I mean, uh, I, I I can give you, you know if. It is very, uh, how to say? It's very hard to work together with victims. It's very hard. It's very hard for a victim to uh, decide to stand up and speak up, and uh, go confront confront the authority and to share their suffering to the with the public. It's very hard. The process, uh, the process of them to grow up and fight for their rights is very very hard. And then they, they cannot go through go through the process by themselves. They cannot. There's no. There there is no. I don't believe there is any person, any single hero. Yeah. Then everyone need help, and everyone need a long struggle, <laughs> long time of struggle to 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 grow up. So this means. So we, if we decide to work together with victim. With and with other peers, with our our with other with other people, with, with all others, that means that we should take care of each other very much. We should take care of each other. We should spend time together. We should listen to. We should you know time is very important. Time actually time is very precious resources. What we can what we can yeah so. Uh, so we should, if you the first the first step to work to to work um, to work to contribute to the mo work for the moment is to spend time with victims and other volunteer and volunteers to listen listen to each other and talk to each other and understand understand the experience as of each other and then you can fight together we can fight together so that's 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 what that's the meaning of effective uh, effective labor. I mean, thank you, Ms. Lupin, for answering these three questions. Um, we are at time, but we I see that we have three questions left or uh, yeah, three questions. Um, it, if it's OK with our panelists, we will just stay for maybe 10 minutes longer to address them. OK, uh, there's a question for um, Mr. He Jian and Ms. Lin Shu Tong. It's the issue of unintended consequences. The current situation of the UK's NHS now with a severe shortage of PPE that when you send wonderful materials out of UK to help China might be seen today as a problem. So this person is interested in the situation of how any NGO or group deals with the problem that within any operation that does good, there will always be a negative case or interpretation that could sink the ship. How does one deal with this issue? Um, I think this question may go may apply to other organizations as well. So if there are other panelists would like to answer this, please feel free to jump in. But for now, I'll hand over to you. Um, okay, that's quite true. I mean, for everything you do, there will, there will be always a unintended consequence for that. And we feel that um, you have to make a judgment, make a decision based on the best uh, information you have and make a judgment um, you know, at that time and we feel that um, the thing of sending materials sending PPE from the UK to China was necessary my argument would be these PPE uh, were used to contain the the virus inside China and hopefully 
uh, they have helped to uh, delay the, 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 spread, the spread of the virus into many other countries. And many other organizations and also countries helped China at that time. When we started this thing in late January, you know, like countries like Iran and Italy, they all helped China and Russia as well. They all, uh, you know, sent um, medical supplies in, in different forms to China. Um, had they thought about the um, outbreak in their own country, would they do the same thing? Um, I would think so, because, you know, um, we are human beings and we are not alone on this planet. And once you see someone suffering out of uh, empathy, and I think it's just human nature that we would like to offer help, to help others, to, to bring them bring they up on their feet. And uh, so countries and organizations did the same thing. And we feel that we had made the, the right decision at that time. Um, but as you are correctly pointed out that the situation has been deteriorated quite badly in the UK. That's why we feel it is necessary now to bring in some of the materials because um, China is now, this situation is very much stabilized and the factories has already started uh, uh, producing the, the PPEs. So that's why we feel it is the right time for um, the Chinese people to do something to the world, so, you know, sending uh, equipment out to the UK, to the NHS and help them to go through this difficult time, to go through this uh, global pandemic. So that's my answer to the question. Thank you, um, Mr. Fujian. Does anyone else on the panel want to jump in on this issue? Okay, um, I see a hand raised by Emily Ma. I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question um, directly. Hi, um, thank you panelists. Um, so my question I actually also um, put in the chat. So I'm curious about how, what's the future of activism in, in China now with sort of increased tensions between the US and China and, and the rhetoric that um, nonprofits are, or, or activists are um, monetarily um, compensated for these kinds of work. So um, I'm curious, what do you think the future is and how can these difficulties be overcome? Thank you. Okay, who, who likes to? Yeah, I, I'd like to just uh, <clears throat> share with you my, my perception. Um, first of all, I, I would like to, uh, to encourage people to think about the bright side of things because, you know, in 10 years, I've seen some really um, good, uh, positive uh, things happening to the NGO sector, but of course, they are. They are shady, uh, uh, shady issues as well. Um, to answer your question, uh, I would say keep the communication channel with the authorities open. <clears throat> that is the most important thing for NGOs in China. Uh, that is, uh, you, you know, uh, try to just build a regular communication channel with the authorities. Of course, you start with the, uh, with where you are registered. For us, for example, we're registered in Shenzhen, so we keep a very open dialogue with uh, the Shenzhen uh, uh, government, uh, especially the Futian district of Shenzhen. Um, oftentimes, when they want to censor you, when the when the local government, uh, I think uh, the local governments are, are more are more a problem than the central government because Beijing, uh, there are a lot of uh, very enlightened uh, well, officials in the central government, but local governments uh, is a totally different matter. I remember in 2010 when we were uh, sort of censored by the public security office <clears throat> in Hefei, when we did the, our training workshop there, they actually sought out uh, my collaborator at the University of Science and Technology of China. They went directly to him and they wanted to find out who I was and uh, what did I do? Did I harbor ill intentions uh, uh, for, 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 for China? 
So there was that uh, communication channel from day one. Actually, our CTO, the chief of technology officer, he also lives in Hefei. So he became like uh, not friends, but he became very friendly with the <clears throat> public security officers. They went out to eat and to to have drinks. That those were the opportunities that were opened up for him to have extended conversations with them about who we are and what kind of person I am. So over time, uh, they were still very vigilant about what we do. However, there is a like a minimal trust that is gradually built between us and the sensors. Um, so communication channel open is very important. Uh, the bright things that I would say, uh, the positive developments in the, in the last 10 years, I'm seeing the NGOs are getting more and more professionalized. <clears throat> there are all kinds of training programs for grassroots NGOs. Um, the other thing is that we need to remember that there will always be the gray zones, no matter how big or how small they are. Sometimes they shrink in response to uh, emerging crisis. But then after a while, the gray zone would uh, gra gradually relax. So there are many opportunities, I think, for NGOs to seize on, to do their work, to get their mission accomplished. It's not so dire, you know. Uh, we say, um, if we look at the books, nothing gets accomplished, right? If we look at the policies, everything. But in reality, <clears throat> if you have a will, uh, there's a will, there's a way. You will get what you want to do accomplished. So I'm an I'm a optimist because being an activist, you have to be optimistic. Otherwise, you won't be able to change anything. So I would say have faith in the fact that the party, the Communist Party itself is not a homogeneous entity. And this is very important for all of us to remember, especially if we have a chance to speak to foreign reporters who love to demonize China. I think it's important for us to let them know that there are different kinds of governments in China. There are local governments, there's central government. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that the public trust in the central government is quite high. It's about 70, 70 to 75 percent. The public trust in local governments is very low. And the public trust in NGOs is also very low. So the government, there are, there are non-confrontational activists within the Communist Party itself. As, uh, well, uh, well, as a matter of fact, I. I have many colleagues, Chinese colleagues, who are working, teaching at national universities like Beijing, Beida, Tsinghua. Many of them are party members. So let us not demonize the Communist Party because it is not a homogenous entity. I would say I ran into more difficulties with local governments than with central government. I don't think we can hear you. Sorry about that. Um, does any other panelists want to jump in on this question? I know. Um, yeah. Um, some, sometimes I think, sometimes my feeling is that everything is going down in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything, everything is going, everything is going, wor it, it's, it's going worse in the, of the world. Of, everything of the world is, go, is going worse. Uh, yeah. So, and, Every time when I have this feeling, I go back. I I come. I go back to my feminist belief. I mean, feminism is always feminism. It does never always does never mean stand on one side between two extremes. Yeah, but it always advocates for an alternative solution of the world. Yeah. Um. Another thing is so another another thing is that. Um, uh, I think it's very important to dirty your hands. I, I, you know, when I when I feel when I feel I, I don't know how to do, I think the important thing is that go to do some field work, make my hand dirty, dirty my hand. Then perhaps I can find some practi practical way to save myself and also the world. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, does Ms. He Jian or 
Ms. Lin Shuzhong want to answer this question as well? Okay, no? Okay, there's um, one more question for Ms. Liu Ping. Um, could you talk about what happened to Deng Fei? So for the, those who don't know, um, Deng Fei is a journalist and a philanthropist famous among Chinese NGO practitioners, and he launched several campaigns on China's social media platform Weibo, such as um, Free Lunch for Children, the anti-child trafficking campaign, etc. And he was accused of sexual assault in 2017. So, Mr. Liping, would you like to answer that? I don't think never, never, never sincerely admit his fault, and never sincerely apologized for, to his victims. And he already uh, sued his victims and uh, supporters of that victim, victim, uh, her, her, his victims, and the support some supporters of that victim to the court. You know, in in, in China, uh, also in some in some in many other countries. Uh, abusers, sexual abusers, are more likely to sue the victims to the court, <laughs> and it's very hard for victims to make them make the abusers uh, accountable. Yeah, that's the reality. And uh, uh, you know the so um, um, but the the Xuanzi, a uh, victim of Zhu, victim and uh, and uh, active now he, she is she is already a very active, very active activist of Me Too movement. Organize a network organize an official network to support all the victims who are experiencing lot, uh, all kinds of troubles after they share their stories. So uh, she has organized a network, a network uh, to support the victims and support their fight on the count. Yeah, this is what I know right now. Okay, thank you. Um, we're out of time. Um, is there anything that we're leaving out here that you feel needs to be addressed to our audience today, to all of our panelists? Okay, um, great. So we covered them all. That, so that concludes our official panel today. Thank you all to our panelists for joining us and also to all the audience who showed up at 9 a.m. On, on Saturday and stayed with us the whole time. I'm grateful for the inspiring and productive conversation that we had. And um, some of our panelists have agreed to share their PowerPoints. Um, and I've also seen people asking for contact info. So if you just leave your emails, you can send them um, in private chat to me. I will collect the information that's, that can be shared with the audience and send them to you afterwards. So if you wanna do that, before you go, just please um, leave your information, your email in the chat box. And yes, the recording will be available online, um, but we will need to figure out if the, tech, the technology worked smoothly throughout the whole time. So um, maybe it won't be posted on, in, in its full length. So um, that's all we have to share today. Please take care and, and enjoy the weekend and stay tuned for other panels and speeches featured by the Brown China Summit on our website. Thank you for coming. If you have more questions, maybe our panelists can hang around a bit more to answer them. But if not, that's also great. And um, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, He Chang, and uh, the other panelists for, uh, for, for this great event. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming.